of an R series. Uh, the first, the finished first, you first must finish. Uh, this is evening is being presented by GMT Composites. Uh, they are a supporter of our race, and we're glad to have them on board. Uh, this webinar, as usual, is also being supported uh, by Gosling's Rum and the Bermuda Tourism Authority. So, cheers. Uh, this evening, we decided that we would take a little bit of a, a different tack, so to speak, on how we were going to do this uh, webinar. And we're taking this webinar that's focused on safety and yacht presentation from the perspective of a new person to the race prepping their yacht uh, in the form of Mark Lenzi, who um, a couple of races ago uh, did just that. He was new to uh, the race and needed to prepare his yacht. And he was able to go through a lot of the technical uh, issues with his yacht, getting it ready with James Fife, who is the chief inspector for the Newport Bermuda race. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark and James, and I will try to do my best to uh, keep them on time so that we can have enough time at the end of this session for questions that I can see are rolling in. So, uh, Mark. Thank you, Summers. Thank you, Summers. Um, so as Summers said, uh, I had done the Bermuda race before and in 2016, it was uh, such a motivational experience that I said, you know, I just got to put my own crew together and, and do it. And that's what we did. So to those of you that are looking at doing this for the first time, just do it. That's the bottom line. Yeah, it, it has proven to be a fantastic experience. Um, and now for me, several times over, uh, I, and I would say of the like the top two or three reasons why I would do the Bermuda race, believe it or not, one of them is to go through this um, safety process that the race has established over from our 100 plus years of experience. Uh, I did it with my crew. My crew was thoroughly involved in all aspects of it, decisions. We did all the training, we did all the work together that we did on the boat. And it has paid back many, many, many times over in our cruising sailing and in our racing sailing in not just my boat, but everywhere my crew goes. Uh, so as background, my boat is a um, Beneteau, a 2004 Beneteau production boat, nothing fancy. So we were starting at the, the baseline of let's get this boat sea going, ocean ready. We had done some cruising, but this really stepped our game up um, a lot and <laughs> has continued to do that. Um, what With that, I'm going to just ask, uh, I engaged James and I started about where you are right now, if you're looking at the uh, 2022 race, so about 18 months out, and you're starting exactly the right time. You need to look at stuff this spring. We're going to go and highlight which things should come first. Um, and I engaged James Fife, who, trust me, is nowhere near as scary as he looks on the video. Absolutely wonderful guy. <laughs> and there were people to help us on every aspect of this all the way through. So uh, I like to ask James to just talk a little bit about the chief inspector role and then we'll go into some of the, and his perspective, and then we'll go into some of the specifics. James? Thank you, Mark. Uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to echo what um, Mark has to say in terms of uh, the experience and the, uh, what I believe is the really the defining point of preparing a boat for the Bermuda race, uh, having done it on several boats and having had the great good fortune of inspecting lots of boats along the way, uh, you always learn something new. And there's so many different ways to do things that uh, it really is, it, for me anyway, it, it's certainly a gratifying experience. Uh, it's a little bit of background, is that, it, as many of you guys know, our race, uh, the Bermuda race, Newport Bermuda race, uh, has a long and enviable safety record, uh, which is in thanks no, in no small part uh, to the emphasis on safety that the race has always had. 
Uh, in recent history, say the last four to five Bermuda races, uh, or yeah, more than say four or five Bermuda races ago, uh, the race was governed by the offshore special regulations, uh, which was promulgated by what is now World Sailing. Many of you uh, know that body as ISAF. Um, those regulations came about in the, the late 1960s in response to a proliferation in ocean racing and the sort of an attendant growing number of safety mishaps. But uh, the offshore special regulations are incredibly detailed. They have references to ISO, CN, ABS, SOLIS, and a bunch of other things and can frankly be a little bit intimidating. So in 2013, U.S. Sailing convened a committee uh, to study the various race requirements uh, and the offshore special regulations in order to develop a more easily understandable set of uh, safety regulations. And the result was something uh, that was called the U.S. Sailing Special Equipment Requirements. Uh, they're available on U.S. Sailing's website. Uh, they are a template for safety requirements for races all over the world. The concept was to create a set of plain English requirements that organizing committees or organizing authorities, I should say, could modify and uh, adapt at their own discretion. And the Bermuda Race Organizing Committee uh, did just that using the SERs as the basis for our first Newport Bermuda Race safety regulations in 2014. Uh, each year since, uh, our committee reconvenes to discuss the learnings from previous years. Uh, previous races and, and, and make any changes that we think are necessary. Uh, for those of you who have not viewed them at this point, the, the NBRSRs, as we call them, uh, are available on the website, uh, which is BermudaRace.com. Uh, what's up there right now is the 2020 regulations, uh, and we have versions up for both monohull and multi-hull vessels. Uh, obviously, for the, the purpose of today's discussion, we're going to focus on the requirements for monohulls, since the vast majority of our entrants uh, are mile hauls, but I'd be happy to speak with anybody. We'll be sharing some contact information at the end here. I'd be happy to speak with anybody who has questions about either the mile haul regulations or the multi haul regulations pretty much at any time. Uh, but again, what's posted right now is the 2020 uh, version, and uh, we'll be increasing or releasing rather uh, the updated 2022 versions this spring uh, along with the, the notice of race. Uh, a few small things to point out uh, in the uh, safety requirements. You will see uh, next to many paragraphs, there's a little red box that says FAQ in it, and that would refer you back to our website uh, where there is a long and, and very helpful, I think, list of uh, frequently asked questions that have to do with specific regulations. Uh, is this acceptable? What do you mean by that? That type of thing. So I would, I would glad, I would, uh, uh, recommend that all of you use that as a tool. Uh, but the number one thing I want everyone one to remember is that we go ocean racing for fun, and preparing for ocean racing should be fun as well. Uh, so please don't approach this as an intimidating or a difficult process. All of the race inspectors are experienced offshore sailors who do this because they like to do this. Um, and I, uh, speaking from experience, uh, and I see many others on the on the line tonight can tell you that uh, this is a really enriching process for us and hopefully for you as well. So with that, Mark, uh, do you have specifics that you would like to talk about, some learnings from our experience in 2015 or 2016? Yes, uh, James, I'd like to go through uh, where, where uh, uh, people should focus on first, where you might have a potential uh, time consuming or lengthy uh, thing or something that is advantage if you do it earlier. So I'm gonna go through just uh, four of them uh, that for my boat were uh, the most long lead items are and mo thus most beneficial to get done first. Uh, so download yourself the, the Bermuda Race Safety Rules. Like James says, we have the 2020 ones up there. The, the, few, the minor, minor changes we're contemplating for 2022 will not make any difference uh, most likely for anybody on the call. Uh, so I downloaded this and, and go through there and make sure you understand what each item is. When you get a list of questions, get a hold of James and he will either answer them or have them off to the specialist sub team that can answer them for you. So you get a, a full understanding of what's what all is involved and who what players, if it's more than just you, 
uh, that I needed to do this. So the first thing that came up with me when I downloaded this, um, I'm a former naval officer, so I knew what the word was, but I didn't know <laughs> that it was needed for my boat, <laughs> this boat, uh, and that's scantlings. Um, I was not exactly sure what they would be for a sailboat, having only driven submarines before. Um, but you need to have these. Uh, we the, our technical committee reviews them, ensure your boat is uh, constructed in a seaworthy manner. They'll stand up to this race. This becomes a totally trivial problem if your boat has been raced any time in this race before. So if you have a Beneteau 47, uh, and it has a Benito 47 has raced in this race before. We have your scantlings. We know your boat's at and a job. Uh, my boat ha uh, had not been raced in the race before. So I needed to produce these scantlings. Um, and if you have a custom design boat, you go to the designer and you're gonna get them. A uh, production boat like mine, you're gonna have to go back to the manu. First of all, you'll go to your dealer and your dealer will look at, give you the blank stare of a what? They have no idea what you're talking about. So eventually you're gonna to have to get back, in my case, to France where the boat was designed and built. Um, and I don't speak French, which complicated, <laughs> that drew out the timeline. And the way I finally got the scantlings after about 15 other different documents was James gave me an example and I sent it to them. I said, I need this for my boat and that's how I got it. So do a quick check, find out if your boat uh, has been raced before, and this only becomes a flag if your boat has never your raced, your type of boat has never raced the Newport Bermuda race before. Um, next is the entire uh, ORR measurement process. Um, the ORR, for those of you not familiar, is I would call it a handicapping system. It's how we're able to race, you know, how do you race boats of all different types against each other and fairly compare them? Well, that's the um, offshore ra racing rules, uh, the whole organization that does this. And to get, if your boat has not been measured for ORR before, this is process definitely requires a bunch of planning. Um, number one, is you have to schedule it. The um, certified measures are not just laying around. There's only a few of them uh, and you need to get on the schedule with them. Second is the conditions uh, necessary to conduct the measurement um, are not to be ignored. Your boat has to be completely offloaded like the day you bought it, nothing on it whatsoever. Um, fuel and water limits and all this stuff. It has to be a, a relatively calm day in order to get the, the stability uh, measurements. So a lot of factors have to come together to do this measurement. So I most strongly encourage you to do that this spring or this at the latest this fall, because it's logical to do it at launch or haul out, because that's when you're most likely to have, be able to have your boat all offloaded and at the dock. Uh, I discourage you from waiting until the spring before the race and lining up with everybody who did not attend this webinar and didn't plan for it, who will be jammed into a queue to get it done. Uh, and if any, uh, this will let you get it done early. Uh, you can evaluate it, um, make sure everything's squared away and just get it off the plate. Um, third thing, Mark, you know, I guess, Yes, Jim. Could, could I jump in just quickly? Um, sure. I think uh, probably one of the most important um, parts of the OR measuring process uh, is the calculation of the stability index. And as uh, many of you probably know, we have a minimum stability index of 115 degrees. Essentially what that means, uh, it's a little more complicated than this, but essentially that means that's the angle to which the boat can be tipped past 90 degrees and it will still come back up. Um, and uh, in order to make that determination, uh, U.S. Sailing, who administers, um, or at least uh, liaises with, with the certified measures and the Offshore Racing Association does as well, um, they take a bunch of measurements of your boat in light condition based on inclinations. And uh, that helps them calculate where it is your boat 
will go to and will then and will still come back up. That is a pretty far, hard and fast rule uh, for us, the 115 degree stability index. And again, that harkens back to our safety record. Uh, that metric has been in place for quite a long time. And uh, there are, every year we hear about a few boats uh, that just are not able to meet that. And uh, unfortunately, there's ways to increase your stability index, such as adding lead to the keel or putting lead in the bilge or something like that. Uh, but it is a little bit more of a process. It may involve a naval architect or something like that. Uh, so that stability index uh, is important early on because you don't want to get so far down the road and then just find out the spring before the race that your stability index is inappropriate. Fortunately, as Mark said, most boats of the same type have roughly the same stability index. Uh, so if you're sailing an Express 37, for instance, and it has a stability index of 117, uh, or other ones do, um, you could be pretty confident that you're going to fall in there. Um, but I just wanted to make that point because that uh, is something that you need to be uh, aware of early on. And, you know, we said it's fun. Fun means you're also going to survive it. So <laughs> this stability index is not is a big deal. Uh, there was a tragedy on Lake Michigan in another race, a uh, boat that should never have gone and, you know, just it dro drove home to us again the importance of the stability index. Uh, my final point is uh, safety at sea training. One third of your crew is required to have 30% as uh, has to have completed uh, the full uh, uh, online courses and then the one day hands-on course. Um, I had not actually heard of this before we started the race, and now I'm in charge of it <laughs> from the New York Yacht Club and the CCA. That's how much a believer I became in it. Uh, and I would uh, offer to you as a, a fellow skipper, this one, you know, in the, the grand scheme of the cost of our boats and putting them to sea, I, I paid for my crew, whole crew to go to this training together, and we all did it together. That was one of the best investments I ever made. Uh, it, not only crew bonding and experience, but you, the depth then of experience and the backup and everybody thinking and helping you create this ethos of safety on your boat, uh, it has paid back many fold. So I strongly encourage you to get more than just your minimum on there. And it also gives you some depth in case one of your crew members, of course, uh, has to cancel at the last minute. But the benefit of all of you going through it, it's gonna just up your whole game on your crew's awareness of safety, safety issues, how they conduct yourself, equipment, uh, potential issues, lessons learned, uh, tremendous payback. Uh, so I strongly encourage you uh, to look at doing that. And you're, you're gonna need to do it um, either, they don't generally don't run during the summer because everybody's out sailing and right now it's all stopped because of COVID so there are the earliest they're going to start again will be late fall or early January and everybody's going to be needing to go through them so when uh, when you see start looking at what ones are going to open in your area sign up early um, and we, we will make sure between the organizers that enough courses are available, but you may not be able to go on, on, on a particular one day. Uh, you're gonna have to be flexible here coming up with the race. So start early on that and get as many as your people in there, I recommend, as you can. Uh, and with that, James, I'm, those are the, the, the big picture ones that the Scantlings, the ORR measurement stability index and safety at sea training that I think all skippers ought to start looking at now and when you're going to do what so that you get these things going. Uh, and now, James, if you want to go through some more sp specifics from the inspectors part, uh, why don't we step into that? I absolutely will, but uh, once again, I'd love to just build on what you had to say. I think Mark sells himself short on the, the safety at sea program, which he has really redeveloped over the last couple of years. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the, the safety at sea has come a long way over the last 20 some odd years. A lot of it, uh, of the pre-work, the studying is done online uh, through uh, modules that you take beforehand so that the real learning can happen 
hands-on. And for those of you who have never, for instance, uh, jumped in the water with a full set of foul weather gear on and boots, it's pretty damn hard to swim. Um, and if you've never had your life vest inflate around you, um, that's a, it's a real experience. If you've never tried to climb into a life raft, which I'm guessing most of us don't do on a Saturday afternoon, uh, it's hard. And so having been there and done it, even if it's in a flat calm pool, um, yes, it is certainly camaraderie building. If you do it with your team, your crew, that's great. But even if you don't, there's so much to be learned. Setting off flares, fighting fires, uh, I, I highly recommend um, that. So, right. um, so, like you will actually, how many of you have actually discharged a fire extinguisher at a you know 10 by 10 flaming diesel fuel pan? Probably not a lot of us, uh, unless you're in the military or for an emergency responder. Yeah, you got to see what that's like when when it goes. How long does a fire extinguisher last? Where do you spray it? What, how effective is it? Have you ever shot a parachute flare a thousand feet in the air and see, compare it to your little handhelds? So it's a, just a, a really uh, good experience, and uh, it doesn't matter your age or physical ability. We will ensure that you never do anything that physically would challenge or, or you're uncomfortable with. Uh, so don't worry about it in that respect. Re really, uh, it's a great experience. So, James? Great. So before we move into some of the details that I wanted to, to go over, I just wanted to see Summers. Do we have any questions at this point that yeah. would make sense or? Yes, I think, yeah, we've had three questions come in and two of them I think we should cover quickly now. One of them okay. we'll get to at the end. The, Questions about the stability indices, obviously, that, you know, it's going to be, a, it's a hot topic. Um, are they published anywhere? And if the stability index is already being calculated for a boat of the same make and model um, do, uh, in an earlier Newport to Bermuda race, does it still need to go through it being measured? Yes. So two parts to that question. One, uh, I must I don't know the exact answer to U.S. Sailing used to uh, publish a database of every boat they've measured and all the measurements. Uh, I don't know if that still happens, uh, but you certainly can get that information by talking to the offshore office uh, at U.S. Sailing. Uh, they, they come over there, uh, runs that office, and they're more than helpful, uh, either by phone or email, and they can tell you sort of what they have uh, for other boats. And it's often worth it just to give Nate a call and say, I, I have a, you know, J42. Uh, I want to know what other J42s measure that uh, stability index. As for uh, getting a measurement, yes, every single boat needs to have its own measurement, its own full measurement, uh, as I understand it, uh, to enter into the race because, uh, you know, a J42 that was version one, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm sort of making this up, may have had a different cabin layout, for instance, or you may have in installed a generator on yours or something like that. So every boat's going to have its own stability index, uh, and its performance package under OOR is going to be a little bit different. So every vessel does need to have um, its own measurement. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the Nate that James mentions, Nathan Titcomb at U.S. Sailing, uh, the off offshore office, just call the desk in the number for U.S. Sailing. They will connect you to the right person. Um, and like James said, the reason the, the SI is, so let's say your boat was built with lead acid batteries. Now I switched them to lithium ion. They're much lighter. Different weight distribution, big weight change, you know, things like that. That's why each boat uh, has to have its own individual measurement, which is all part of the ORR measurement process. And it raises the issue if you make changes to your boat, obviously, you need to be remeasured. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. The only other, the other question had to do with um, navigation lights, uh, spare navigation lights. And oh, I'm going to get to that. Yeah. I promise. So anyway, carry on. <laughs> okay. Good enough. Um, Kate, if I can, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I hope this doesn't blow the whole thing up. Uh, so share. Uh, and hopefully all of you are looking at uh, the Newport Bermuda Race 2020 safety requirements for monohulls. Those of you who haven't seen it, I thought it might be helpful just to, to see uh, how they're laid out. Uh, you can see they're paragraph 
uh, form, relatively straightforward, straight English. They talk about preparation and inspection, what the inspections might look at like, uh, maintenance of your equipment. And then uh, the first topic I wanted to talk about, you see here are our FAQ boxes that I referenced. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the heavy items um, requirement. And it essentially says that a boat's heavy items, such as batteries, stoves, toolboxes, anchors, and chains, and internal ballast shall be secured. So that seems relatively intuitive. Um, it, it, the perfect example, I think, here are floorboards. Uh, and the way I think about this requirement is if you were hypothetically to turn your boat upside down and shake it, what would come out and potentially hurt the occupants who are holding on for dear life? Uh, not that I think anybody is going to get into that predicament in the, in the Newport Bermuda race, but that is uh, the, the standard to which we hold people. So floorboards are a perfect example. If they just lay in the, in the pan, we're going to want some type of securing. And I think this is probably as good a place as any to say that for almost everything in the Newport Bermuda race requirements, there's probably an expensive way to do things and a less expensive way to do things. Um, you could certainly have your boat yard uh, scarf in nice AB rotating uh, latches uh, into your teak and holly floorboards. Um, and that certainly would cost, that would certainly do the job, but it would cost a fair amount of money. But there's other ways to go about it. I know people who have uh, connected some shock cord uh, to the, the, maybe they've uh, glued some pad eyes into the bilge and to the underside of the floorboard. In a relatively tight piece of the shock cord, it's not going to stop the floorboard from moving, but it's certainly going to keep it from flying across the cabin or something like that. Uh, lots of boats these days are built out of, uh, uh, with uh, high-tech materials, and composite floorboards are very light. So a lot of um, racers these days are using heavy-duty du industrial Velcro. Um, and it's amazing how well that stuff holds to the point that it's, all, it's almost hard to get it, the floorboard up when you do need to lift it up. Uh, so there's ways to do it, but uh, the real thought I have is that, you know, heavy items are anything that could come adrift. So, for instance, under your settee cushions, if you have a locker underneath your settee cushions and then you store an anchor in there or anchor chain or something like that, that's certainly a, a heavy item that could come loose. It's certainly something we're going to be looking for and uh, you need to either lash it in place or have some kind of positive fastener on the floor, on the, uh, on the bunk cover or something like that. Fuel tanks is another example. Um, so that's one that uh, I wanted to, to point out to everybody. And what I'd like to it's sort of, in, I've seen all sorts of different ideas of the way this is done. Here's a good example of a fridge, a, a, a ice box. Um, and you can see this clever person uh, took what looks like a wheel brake. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's a long rod with a knurled knob. And they threaded it in there. And, and you can see that it, when the fridge is closed, they insert it. It inserts into that hole right there and keeps the fridge box uh, closed so that your milk won't come flying out or something like that should you get into that kind of a, of a condition. Uh, so, again, uh, that's, that's a... Uh, an easy way to comply with what sounds like a somewhat intimidating uh, regulation. Uh, another one that I think I'd like to, to mention briefly James? is... Yes, uh, I'm sorry, Mark. Okay, as a, as a person going through it with James, when I came to this one, being the nuclear submariner I am, I came up with the extremely expensive answer and was stunned by it. And James talked me down off the edge. So call... Uh, our, our basic rule on, on, the, on going into this as an owner is if, if what you're thinking of doing to meet the requirement looks like an enormous project and, ex or, and or extremely expensive, get on the phone to, to us and they have, the inspectors have seen hundreds of ways of going about this. Talk it through before you launch into some major project uh, and, and make sure you... Uh, you really understand the, re the requirement and you're not going overboard and, and you know options that you have on it. And do, do not hesitate to call at any time the inspectors. Uh, they'll gladly discuss with you the, all what they've seen. James? Absolutely. So thank, thank you, Mark. 
Uh, another one that I'd like to mention, because it seems a little bit daunting, is the calculation of your cockpit volume. Uh, we require that there's a maximum volume uh, that a, a cockpit can't be greater than, the theory being that if it fills up with water, um, it is going to be somewhat of a destabilizing force. And uh, it talks about how the maximum cockpit volume, volume for cockpits uh, that aren't open to the sea, i.e. completely self-draining at very high speeds, uh, cannot be more than this formula here, which is 0.06 times the length overall, which is pretty easy, the maximum beam, which is pretty easy, uh, the freeboard abreast the cockpit. So, you know, if you take a tape measure and go to the, the gunnel uh, next to your cockpit and measure to, the, measure to the water, that's the freeboard abreast the cockpit. You do that calculation, and your, and your cockpit volume can't be greater than that. So how do you measure the cockpit volume? Do you have to get a, you know, a naval architect involved? Well, you certainly could, um, but it's not, that's not the precision we're looking for. Um, here's an example of a, this is probably a boat you wouldn't take to Bermuda, but it helped me illustrate it for a seminar I did quite a while ago. Uh, you can separate your cockpit into a couple geometric shapes. And uh, in this case, I have a rectangle in the cockpit well and another rectangle that would be above the cockpit well there. And that would be enough to let you know. If you're really, really close, we might want to do a little more investigating. Uh, but my guess is that 90% of the boats out there aren't going to run into a problem with this one. So don't stress out too much about it. Um, it it's a relatively uh, simple calculation to make. Mark, I don't know if you have anything to add there uh, before no, I move I'm on. I'm a self-draining cockpit, so I just sailed right on when I got to this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. James and Mark, I just want to just raise a point. It's um, We're 33 minutes into it already, so just to uh, give you a time's up. Okay, so move on. Okay, I will, uh, I'll, I'll try to go a little bit quicker. Mass step, securing your mass step, again, could be uh, somewhat intimidating. There's multiple ways to do this. The picture I'm showing you right now, uh, somebody has put a, a half round or an eye on the mass step. When the mass goes down into the step, there's a rod that goes through, holds it in place. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, uh, the reason we do this mass step securing is we don't want the lower end of the mass to come adrift and become a pendulum within the inside of the boat should something let go up above. If your rig were to break at the spreaders, for instance, nothing would be supporting it, and we don't want that mass step swinging around and ripping things up down below because you're going to have enough other things happening or, or concern, concerning things going on. Uh, another way to do it, um, if you have a mass jack, uh, is just to put something in the mass jack opening. Uh, this, this person lashed a piece of wire to the, to the mass step. Uh, it's going to achieve the purpose. We don't need it to be solidly affixed. We just don't want it going crazy. Um, so that, that's another one. Uh, spare nav lights. So there was a question about nav lights. Yeah. So you can get very complicated with nav lights. Back, I remember my father was preparing his boat for the Bermuda race back in the dark ages. Um, he had a, you know, a set of um, nav lights on the pulpit and the stern, and, and he had a, a tricolor at the top of the mast, and so those were his two nav lights. But uh, we required that they uh, be connected to a different power source. So, I mean, he had a motorcycle battery that was in the, you know, especially wired down below and alligator clips and you could turn it on and stuff like that. Don't, don't mess around with that. Uh, I don't want to endorse products um, out of school, but NaviSafe here, I guess I will, uh, NaviSafe here make these things cost probably, I think they're less than $50. And they're tricolor lights that can be set up. They're not going to be perfect, but they can be set up on the deck. And you press a button once and the green sector comes on. You press it again, the red one comes on. You press it a third time, they both come on. You get the idea. This is a great way, an elegant way to solve what heretofore has been a very difficult problem. If you have a tricolor at the top of your mast and you have uh, uh, pulpit-mounted nav lights, the way we interpret the regulation is that as long as they are on separate breakers at the panel, we will consider those two together uh, to meet the requirements of the, of the secondary nav lights. 
before I go on, Summers, do we have any other questions that I need to get to before? Um, um, no, we're, we're okay. good so far. Okay. We have a requirement um, that's unique to our race uh, that all boats be capable of uh, setting a preventer for the main boom uh, when you're going downwind. And uh, again, there are mo multiple ways, as all of you I'm sure know, uh, to lash your boom out. But the really elegant solution that I've seen is demonstrated by this picture here. Uh, and it, I, it's sort of a cartoon, so I apologize. But you can see there's a line that's permanently attached to the end of the boom, this green line. that just gets pulled forward and lashed to the, to the gooseneck uh, most of the time. Then when it's time to set your preventer, you simply run a line up through a block on the bow and connect them and pull it tight. Uh, that is a very easy, elegant way to uh, have a preventer set up that's always in place. All you have to do is, is go up on the foredeck and make that connection. A lot of people lash their booms around the, uh, around the boom bang, and the danger there is should you dip the boom bang, you're likely going to break. I mean, dip the boom the stresses will likely break the boom, as you can see in this picture. So that's why we like the end of the boom setup. So, and J James, most of the ones I've, like this is the rig I use on my boat, that short line, the line that's attached to the end of the boom that you lead forward, a lot of people like I do put one on each side um, so that you're not going under the vang and everything like that. You just take the one on the appropriate side and hook it to the preventer on that side and away you go. Sure. No, that, that's absolutely right. And uh, a lot of people have these sort of pre-set up. Maybe the lines are in place just down on deck, so all you have to do is make the connection. But uh, yep. simple way to, to solve that problem. Uh, I was going to go on and talk about AIS, but Mark, I don't know if you want to talk about personal AIS beacons. I know you have a lot of experience. Yeah, just briefly on this one. And, and when you take the, when you take the safety at sea course, you if I don't make you a believer on, on these things at that course, I've failed in my mission. Uh, th these are the greatest advance to saving a person at sea that has occurred in the last 30 years. Uh, when I say at sea, I mean out in the ocean. Uh, uh, as a naval officer, uh, I was supervising a man overboard on a, a Arleigh class, Arleigh Burke class destroyer, 50 or high to eye. The bridge, we were 55 feet above the water. 12 lookouts who knew the person was going to go in the water. And we put this uh, Navy dummy that's life size in the water. And in less, slightly less than a ship length, we can no longer see them in moderate seas. Uh, so if you really need to have a way to find that person, and these are the greatest things because. They signal boats in the vicinity. They're not just going to a satellite to a rescue organization. Anybody equipped with AIS in range is going to have a bead on this person in the water. And they're integrated with your navigation system. So they go right on your chart plotter, point to point, you can steer right and it moves with them because it's AIS. Um, so, uh, you, it's just that's why we require it. It's for everybody on board. Uh, they're uh, a m minimal cost for a tremendous advantage. Um, they're made by two manufacturers. We have videos on how to set them up if you have any doubt. Uh, just do it. <laughs> that's what you need to know there. No, and I think a, a good sobering statistic, um, and I hope I do my math right here, is that you know these. Uh, a sailboats these days, the planing hulls, they'll do 18 or 20 knots downwind. And if somebody falls overboard and for whatever reason they become separated from the boats, if you're doing 20 knots, within three minutes that person is going to be a mile behind you. And you're going to have a hell of a time seeing that person in any kind of a seaway, particularly if it's any kind of breeze. Um, so it's something that uh, having this personal AIS beacon you know, if you had a personal EPIRB as well, and for those of you who don't understand the difference, or maybe I can just, you can humor me by reminding you, an EPIRB emergency position indicating radio beacon will transmit your position to safety, to uh, search and rescue authorities, most likely in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, where the big search and rescue uh, command center is. But that doesn't really help if you're seeing boats sail by you. 
Um, so having these AISs, uh, we require, uh, as part of the race, uh, having a AIS transmitter and receiver on the boat. And uh, if you can show up on somebody's AIS, say at nighttime, with an M MOB uh, 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 signal, for instance, uh, they're going to know something's wrong and they're going to come after you. So I, I agree with Mark. It's an incredibly, um, an incredibly valuable innovation and tool, and it is, you know, potentially a little bit expensive, but I think it's something that's uh, that, that's James, well. That, that got me another another tip. If you're contemplating buying uh, AIS beacons, life jackets and stuff, you might want to wait till your safety at sea course because you're going to get to go in a pool with a life jacket and that will be a learning experience. You might, you might decide on different, we'll show you the different designs and pros and cons and ways they're worn and things that go in them. Um, and then you can get them in the spring sale uh, before the race uh, after you've actually tried them out and seen um, you know, all the different types there are. And we'll also, the vendors are at these safety at sea courses. So they'll have them all, all different makes and models there uh, that you can, and you can talk to the vendors about. Very, very good point, Mark. Summers, so, do we have James, a question? Yeah, it's, um, it's, we're, we're 42 minutes into this and I don't want to keep anybody longer than we really necessary, but um, we've had a quick question. I just want to know, um, interested in seeing some emergency rudder possibilities. Were you going to be able to talk anything about that? Uh, yes, we can. Um, let me throw up another picture I have to share my screen again. Um, that's a great question. This is certainly, uh, I, I'm hoping you can all see my screen at this point. This is certainly one way uh, to solve this problem and will work very well. You can see this boat owner has mounted a completely secondary uh, rudder with a tiller, kind of like a laser rudder, uh, that they can slide into place should they lose their primary steering system. That's probably the best that I've seen. Uh, but it's probably not practical for the majority of us um, who are out there. So recently, within the last 10 years, uh, there's been a uh, video out there put together by Michael Keyworth, who some of you may well know, uh, of steering using a, uh, a drogue uh, and how you, different techniques on how to steer with a drogue should your rudder be disabled. I'm the first to tell you, uh, and I think, Lots of people on this phone will agree, or on this call will agree, it's not perfect. It, it, it takes practice. You're not going to be doing attacking duel upwind with it, but it'll keep you going in the straight line. And that's really what, it'll keep the boat settled and it'll keep you going in a straight line, most likely. And that's primarily uh, what you're after. But I would highly recommend searching the video. Um, if you, if you were to search drogue steering, for instance, I'm sure it will come up on, on YouTube. Michael put together, I think, a 12 to 14 minute presentation that tells you all the important stuff you need to know. For instance, that you need a very good swivel at the drogue part of it um, because the drogue tends to oscillate and uh, it'll wrap the line up very quickly unless you have a very good swivel. So those that's an option. Uh, other ways people have tried it. Uh, you can, some people feel they can steer their boats with their sails. I'm not a huge fan of that because I always assume the worst case scenario that say you hit something and the rudder's wedged hard to starboard. So the boat just wants to go in circles. Nothing you do with the sails is going to keep you going in a straight line. So having something not only that uh, works for your boat, but that you can demonstrate for us, not, you know, none of us being inspectors, none of us want to go sailing with you as much as we'd love to, uh, we just don't have that kind of time. So if you can tell us and show us that you've made this work on your boat, um, we'll, we will accept that. Um, and I think this is probably a good time, uh, and Summers or, or Mark cut me off if I'm talking for too long, but it's probably a good time to talk a little bit about the inspection process itself. Um, uh, and while James, I'm I just wanted to throw in one thing. When, when yeah. I first saw this requirement, I gave James a hard time about it. I said, well, how often does somebody lose a rudder? He said, well, go look at the stats, Mark. So I went back and looked at the Newport Bermuda race. The answer is, on average, one per race. 
one per race. And in fact, in 2018, we did. Had a boat completely lose their rudder, sheared right off. So it happens. So, <laughs> Same thing happened in 14. And yeah, uh, yeah so it, it does happen, unfortunately. So inspection process. Uh, when it comes to spring of the race time, we will have a list of inspections, inspectors and contact information on the website. We don't generally assign inspectors to racers, but we're certainly happy to make that suggestion if it's helpful. But we have a list of where inspectors are located. There's 50 to 60 some odd of them. Uh, and they're located everywhere from the Midwest through Newport, Maine, down to Florida in Charleston, um, mostly in the contiguous US. Uh, and their contact information, both their cell phone number or perhaps their office number, something like that, and their email is there. You pick one, uh, give them a call, tell them what you're up to, um, tell them when you'd like to be inspected. You'll talk it through a fair amount. And uh, when your boat is ready, we'll come up with a date, and it probably takes an hour to two. Uh, a well-prepared boat, you can probably do an inspection in easily in two hours. And part of that is, you know, we talked about how we don't love to go sailing with you. I also probably don't want to see you raise your storm sails um, if it happens to be blowing 30 and 45 degrees outside and raining on the day of the inspection. So do it on a calm day uh, with your crew and take some pictures or take, take a video of your emergency steering and how it works uh, just to show us that you've done it and that they work on your boat. The number of boats that I've heard of that says, oh, yeah, here's my trisail never put it up and when they go to put it up they realize that the track is wrong or it doesn't fit or umpteen other things um so do this all this stuff up with your crew it's great training and there's some training requirements uh towards the end of, of the safety regulations as well you can do it all at the same time man overboard damage control um take those pictures and then just show them to us maybe on your smartphone and that really um cuts down on the inspection so james do you do you have a quick photo you want to show of a well-prepared yacht? I, I know you use that uh, that phrase. What what does that mean when an inspector? Ah, uh, yeah. It's almost like we prepared this, isn't it? Um, a good photo of a well-prepared yacht. I have some good ones, uh, courtesy of a previous chief inspector, John Winder, who I believe is on this call. And I don't. Am I still sharing? I apologize. Yes, you are, I, I, James. Sometimes I lose. I lose track of. of You're still what sharing, so. But here's here are some uh, some pictures of a of a well prepared boat. Um, this is a J forty two, where uh, when the inspector went on board, you can see everything was laid out for them. Um, there's the inspector going through the checklist. Uh, safety uh, lifelines and, and other equipment laid out, the EPIRB. Um, there's some life jackets, all the official documentation that was required back at the time, uh, the flares, the abandoned ship bag, the engine spares, uh, and then, of course, all of the other stuff. So these are right. some pictures of a very well-prepared boat that we love to see. So, so what you're saying is inspectors don't don't want to see crew members crawling into spaces trying to retrieve things that may or may not be there, and um, you know you want you want things to be efficient, right? Yes, that's probably the best way to end an inspection very quickly is to uh, <laughs> not be prepared and not you know give the impression that you sort of turned your mind to this that morning uh, right. because. We are, as much as we love to do this, we're volunteering our time. And uh, we do like, well, you know, if you show us you're well prepared, we're more likely to put in the effort to spend time with you to make sure that you're in great shape. Great. Perfect. Uh, we had 10 minutes left. Uh, Mark, did you have any, anything else you wanted to add? Uh, if there are no specific questions, uh, just and I, I did see the text is coming across when we talked about the steering with a drogue. Uh, one thing we did learn from that 2018 uh, loss of rudder, uh, where the drogue, the lines, the line comes back to the drogue and you have a swivel. There's so much load on that drogue uh, that the swivel may not swivel. If you just have the standard kind that's a bolt, 
like most people do on an anchor. And you need a ball bearing swivel. And you might ask, where do you get a ball bearing swivel? Well, the fender, landfall, they got ball bearing swivels. I went and refitted my boat after I saw that. I don't use a drogue for emergency rudder, but I said, hmm, that would be helpful on my drogue. And we, actually the comp Gale Rider company rep was with us when we did this testing and, and agrees in that assessment that a ball bearing swivel uh, is what you need if you're gonna use a drogue for steering. So I saw a couple comments on that. Just wanted to add that. Um, Right. No, I, I. Uh, Mark, what about bilge pumps? Ah, yes. Bilge about bilge pumps? Yeah, bilge pumps. Um, Everybody's so favorite topic. It is, and uh, you know, ex Navy, ex Submariner, again here speaking. Uh, the health of your boat starts in your bilge. The first thing I look at, pull up a deck plate. Let me look at a person's bilge. The story is told. Clean they're not bilge, deck plates; they're floorboards. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Those things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pull up the floorboard. Look what's down there. If you see debris, oil, mess, that boat's in trouble. It doesn't matter what bilge pump in the world you got. It's going to get jammed up. If you got junk in the bilge and you, and the reason you have a clean bilge, if anything goes wrong anywhere in APS equipment, it shows up in the bilge first and you'll find it. So clean bilges, step one. Step two, proper bilge pumps. Uh, make sure they're sized right, make sure they're healthy, hoses are good, installed the right direction. We've seen them installed the wrong, you know, pumping the wrong way. Actually make them pump. Put water in your bilge, make sure it actually goes overboard. Almost all production boats will need to add one bilge pump. That's the one that we require that you have a manually operated bilge pump ready to go plumbed inside the co the so the what do we say salon James or in in down below. Down below. Down, okay, below. down below you gotta so most all, everybody's built with one in the cockpit that you can hand pump you've all seen them almost no boats built that has a manual one down in the salon so you, you're probably gonna have to add that one and, and that's a little bit of work but just do it <laughs> We just we want to set you up for success. If, if if water starts coming into the boat and it's the middle of the night and you're in the Gulf Stream, you're going to be I'm, I would be freaking out, and I don't want to be looking for a bucket or you know trying to figure out what I'm going to do. So we want those pumps both on deck, totally redundant systems, one on deck, one down below, completely independent of each other that you can literally walk up to and just start pumping. We want the handle right then, right there, tied to it. Just start pumping. You don't have to turn any valves or, you know, connect any hoses or anything else because that's going to buy you time. Um, and if you can get two of your crew members pumping full speed uh, while you figure out where the water's coming from, you're going to you're going to be, you know, thank us or don't thank me. Thank World Sailing, I suppose, uh, for this requirement. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's a difficult one. It tends to be one of the more expensive ones to uh, comply with. Uh, but it's well, well worth it. Uh, in my opinion. So uh, just one question, one more question. Is there something that seems to surprise most first time participants when it comes to inspections? James? Oh, you that, you've already covered. That, that's a very good question. I mean, there's so many details that uh, inevitably something catches somebody by surprise. But I think that what I most often run into is a, a, a first time participant that says, hey, I just can't figure out the right way to, you, know, you name it, uh, uh, secure my mass step. And yeah. they think, oh, I'm gonna pay with a bow yard, it's gonna cost me 1500 bucks and I don't know if it's worth it. There's easy ways to do these things, talk to somebody, because I think that surprises a lot of people. Right, yeah. Oh yeah, I think you, you covered that well earlier in the presentation with the uh, floorboards. Um, sure. You know, different ways you can you can skin the cat, so to speak. Sure. Uh, Maybe uh, if we have I a hope. minute or two more, I, I have one or two other things that I will just mention quickly, if if with your permission, oh. Summers. Yeah, um, we've got a couple minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
One is there's a requirement in the require in the safety requirements that you have adequate adequate tools and spare parts on the boat to maintain the system. And that's where we talk about uh, the system, the uh, tools you would need to separate your rig from the boat should it come fall over. Uh, and it does happen from time to time, not very often, but every 10, 5, 10 races, the boat does lose its rig. And again, it's a situation where the thing, it's going to be the middle of the night, it's going to be in the Gulf Stream, it's going to be windy. Uh, and the thing's going to be slamming up against, you know, what's left of the rig is going to be hitting up against the side of the boat potentially. And you're going to have to figure out how to just jettison the whole thing. And so you could take a hacksaw and try to cut through uh, the stainless steel rod. Uh, or I don't even know what they make. I guess it's, I'm not even sure what they make it out of. Uh, but it's going to take you a good long time. Uh, you can, my answer to that is every, all of the above. Bring, bring a mallet and a drift pin to drive out uh, uh, clevis pins, bring a hacksaw, bring the latest and greater, greatest rigging cutters if you want, uh, and then Mark has a great solution as well. Right, we take, we <laughs> use the, uh, I do this as safety at sea course, I take some person who obviously is, who looks to me as they never used a hand tool in their life, and I give them, you know, a battery, the battery and the, um, gr and a battery powered grinder, and I say, and I bring one of my five, uh, an old piece of five eighths inch stainless steel uh, backstay cable and say, cut this. And everybody's able to do that. And then I get this, oh, but it won't work in the water. Wrong, because I can dump that thing underwater in a bucket, which I do, take it out and cut it. Um, a DC power tool, which is why warships use DC power for damage, for damage control purposes, it works underwater. It uh, doesn't short out. Now, I wouldn't go run my grinder underwater regularly, uh, but you, you, you're, you're gonna be able to use that thing and it, and it will go, I, I put somebody to work with a hacksaw and I put somebody to work with a grinder and obviously there's no contest uh, on that. And that that gets maybe made my last point. All of this that we're talking about, you've gotta go do it. There is no substitute for testing your theory on how you're going to do whatever in a piece of equipment, except to go out and do it with your crew, which is another piece of why this whole experience, the whole experience was so valuable to my crew. We, we actually changed a lot of stuff on our boat uh, because of actually going out and trying all this stuff and making it work. And we're far better sailors for it. Great. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a good takeaway, Mark. Um, all right, I uh, I'm going to wrap this up here. Uh, we've we've done an, an amazing job, I think, keeping it within an hour, uh, barely, just by about a minute. Uh, I think we covered a lot. We covered a lot uh, today, and I want to thank James and Mark for sort of guiding us through a lot of the little idiot, idiosyncrasies of the uh, safety regulations and and preparations for your yacht. Um, I hope to see uh, a lot of the people that are online tonight on the start line in 2022. And uh, I wish you all luck in uh, preparing your yachts for 2022. And uh, Kate's just throwing up the contact details uh, for Mark and for James, uh, James for inspections especially, uh, as you go forward and prepare your yachts for the 2022 race. And uh, there's a there's a St. David's Lighthouse winner that was uh, fitted with a new GMT comp composites mast for the race in uh, 2018, I believe. Um, so thank the GMT composites uh, for this evening's chat, and as well uh, Gosling's Rum and Bermuda Tours Authority. Go to Bermuda.com. Uh, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, Summers.